Good morning. Good to see you here today. I'm Brother Mal. I'm the pastor here at the church, and we are happy and excited to welcome guests with us. We are excited you've come to be a part of our service today. Thank you for coming. And as always, we are happy, happy, happy to welcome our Briar Hill family. Thank you for coming and being part of this service. It's the last service we're going to have on a Sunday morning before it's a new year. So it's the way to finish out, right? Amen. So we are excited you've come. Brother Jeremy is going to be preaching today. He is here. <laughs> he's going he's gonna to share with us in a little bit, and uh, we appreciate him filling in for us today. And, uh, I like to just kind of hang around. Y'all will let me do that today. So uh, we want to remind you of your worship folder that you have in your hand, and if you don't have one, be sure to pick one up as you leave. There will be a lot of announcements that you can read about in your bulletin schedule for this week. We just want to remind you of a couple of things, changes in the schedule. No Monday night prayer meeting. No Monday night prayer meeting. That's tomorrow night, right? And then Tuesday night, I believe is New Year's Eve. Is that right? And uh, there will be a gospel group or two here on that night uh, singing. And uh, they don't usually keep you until midnight. I think they tried that a few years ago and everybody fell asleep during prayer. <laughs> I'll tell you something. Uh, it'll be a, a short time. Uh, we want you to be sure to read about that. And Stan is uh, one of our members of the Revelation. And so that's his ministry. He likes to come and share that with us once a year. So we encourage you to come if you can on Tuesday night for that gospel singing. And a love offering will be taken that night. Then Wednesday night, there are no uh, regular services, no activities here on the hill. So take note of those things and uh, ring out the old year and ring in a new year. And let's pray that the new year is going to be just fantastic. Amen. Jeremy, I think, is going to remind us of the past year a little bit today. So we look forward to that. You be praying for him. Be praying for John as he's going to come. Connie's with us today filling in. We've got... All kinds of guests with us. Uh, going to crank the drums up. Yeah. He's going to. Well, we're going to worship. <laughs> and we're going to have fun. And we are glad you've come to be a part of it. We uh, want to say thank you to everybody who helped and the love does. You reached out in a tremendous way. If you uh, didn't walk through prior to or were not a part of the giving of gifts um, Tuesday of last week. All of those cubicles over in the fellowship hall were full of gifts. Uh, there were other rooms that were just full of gifts for families and individuals and children. And uh, you blessed as a church uh, family after family after family after family. And I know they are grateful and uh, we want to say thank you to everybody who participated in that. But we want to pray right now and uh, worship and praise and uh, y'all got your singing shoes on. Amen? Amen. Baptists can't have dancing shoes on. We got to have singing shoes. So we're going to sing in a moment and praise and worship and uh, we want you to be sure to join us. But we're going to pray right now and ask the Lord to come bless us. Father, thank you so much. Thank you for being who you are. Thank you for creating us. Thank you for giving us worth and value, meaning and purpose in life. Father, there's some maybe struggling with that here today. We pray that you would just uh, let them know they're loved, that you care, that you know where they are and what they're going through, and that you're just going to lift them up, strengthen them, and bless them. And Father, at the same time, we pray that you'll help us to lift you up, to lift up the name of Jesus be strengthened by the Holy Spirit as we do so. Father, we pray that this service will be a glory and an honor to your name, that you will be glorified in every measure of what we do here today. I pray for Jeremy as he's going to come later to, to preach, and I pray that you will fill him with your Holy Spirit, anoint him, and I pray for the response time, that we might be responsive.
to what you lead us to do. We pray for this worship time that uh, you will help us to sing uh, to the top of our, our voices and worship and praise you in a way that is pleasing to you. Father, we pray that you'd forgive us of our sins and cleanse us and remove anything that might stain or hinder this service. Thank you for all of our guests here today, Father, and I pray that you will just uh, thrill them with having been in your house today and just meet a special need that they might have as well. We love you, Father. We praise you, and we want to sing your praises just now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Well, good morning. I hope that you've had an incredible week, but I don't know about you, but uh, I'm not ready for Christmas to be over yet. So let's stand together as we sing this carol.
with me. Dear Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to be in your house to worship you today. Praise your holy name, dear God, and thank you for being our Father, and I thank you for being our God. Thank you for being the Messiah. May you bless this offering today. May you bless the gift and the giving. We ask the special blessings on Brother Jeremy today as he prepares your word. In your precious name. Amen. <laughs>
worship Him, to be able to come back together in a group and just to be able to lift up our voices and to be able to sing His praises. Let's sing this song. The
presence. We just thank you so much, Lord. Father, that you took our sins and you separated them so far as the east is from the west. Father, they will never see uh, see those sins again if we just come to you and just ask for forgiveness. So, Father, uh, on behalf of this congregation, Lord, we're just pleading today for forgiveness. Father, please let our hearts be the kind of hearts that um, are just ready to move on. Father, to start a new beginning with a new deal. Father, to be free of those things that have just chained us down. Father, you make all things new. And we praise you for that. Lord, thank you that we can become today a new creation found in you, blessed by you. Lord, we love you. Father, I pray that you'll be with Jeremy as he comes to preach, to be able to share those words, Father, that you've laid on his hearts. Father, I pray that, um, Lord, that our hearts and minds and ears will be stirred and that we'll respond to you today, Father. Lord, we love you. We thank you. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John. Thank you, choir instrumentalists for leading us to that throne of worship this morning. We'll be in John chapter 15, as you can probably already tell by the screens as well as the bulletin. Uh, as Brother Miles said, my name is Jeremy Burnham. I'm the associate pastor here, and as, as he said, I do want to welcome all our guests. Uh, our members know one thing about me. If they don't know anything, they know this. I sometimes get to talking a little fast, and, and sometimes. And, and if I do, let me, just, let me just go ahead and apologize for that. I realize that's good. In a sense, we can get out of here and get to Mama's Kitchen a little bit faster than the crowd. But you probably don't understand half of what I say. And so, spiritually speaking, that's probably not the best. So, if you didn't catch anything, if I speed up, just I'll email you my notes or whatever. We'll be, we'll be fine. But I'll try my best to stay slow. But if I'm talking too fast, just listen fast as well. This year has been such a great and awesome year for our church. And it's now coming to an end. It's December the 29th. We've got just a few more days left. But it, it, it's t this time of year that in this technical world that we live in, we see a lot of recaps or reviews, uh, if you will. Uh, those who do social media, which is definitely the majority of this, this body now, uh, sometimes the social media, Facebook, whatever things, will kind of send you an email or recap of your interactions and things you've done, the, the pictures people liked and things like that. And it's pretty neat to see that, what was influential among others and people you uh, corresponded with. Uh, because of this technical age we live in and media, uh, the if digital age, we, we read a lot, we listen to a lot of dig digital media. And because of that, we know we're no secret to that. Data is being kept on us. And it might sound a little frightful. I didn't mean to scare you or anything. But uh, it's pretty neat that we can go back and see uh, the things that we listened to throughout the year, uh, things that we read and watched and all that stuff. I know Spotify sends you an email of music you listen to. A lot of Bible apps will kind of recap the, how much you spend in God's Word if you're using that as, a, as an opportunity to read God's Word. Um, even our, our cell phones now will tell us our screen time. It'll tell us how long you've been looking at your phone and what you've been looking at. And uh, it, it's pretty neat about that. I know that I have a smart thermostat at my house, uh, and I get readings every month, and especially in the year-end, it tells me how much energy I've used. And you probably get notifications from your utility companies telling you how much energy you use, just enough to scare you once you keep the lights turned off and keep the heater turned down to 60 degrees so you don't spend too much money. Um, we live in a time where we have uh, online banking. We can go, with a few clicks, we can go a recap and see how much money we've spent and where our money has went and the, the ways it went against our budget. Uh, I'd be in terrible shape if I saw a review of how much fast food and where all that went to for me this year, but uh, that's just kind of where we're at. Maybe your, per your workplace is, is doing a year-end review or year-end analysis or inventory and things like that. And, and so for us today, for us as Christians, uh, oftentimes we start to get to the beginning of the new year and we always do want to do a reality check. And, and uh, sometimes we grade ourselves better than we want to grade ourselves. But either way, we, we begin to look at things and things that we can change and things that we want to do, what we determine uh, from these things that I mentioned, we can find our habits, our strengths, our weaknesses oftentimes. We can see what our past was to lead us to our future. For us as Christians, our ultimate future is to be Christ-like, to be like Christ. Um, we live in a time where we think that that is just unattainable. In our finite minds, things that we can never be like Christ, 
we can't be Christ, we know that, but we can be as close to him as possible. And today we're going to talk about that and how we can be Christ-like. Uh, as we look over 2019, we might say, you know, Jeremy, there are some things that probably says maybe uh, I wasn't being that way. Maybe I wasn't, uh, definitely couldn't be in that category. Uh, read with me in John chapter 15. We'll begin in verse 1. Verse 1 says, I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Verse 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. But, this is, but this, my father, by this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so pr prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that, you may, that my joy may be in you, that your joy may be full. Pray with me. Father, we come to you thanking you for this time, this worship service, that we read your word. And Father, we ask that your word just pierce our hearts this morning. Father, that your word would just instruct us and teach us this morning, Father, I pray that we no longer listen to words that I have to say, but you speak to our hearts this morning. We thank you for this time. We thank you for this opportunity to worship. And we give this time to you. And sing your son's precious name we do pray. Amen. Uh, several months ago, I was listening to a sermon, sitting to a worship service, about several, bunch of people, 1,100 plus people. And it was a sermon about discipleship. Um, and the, the pastor was speaking, and he referenced John 15, 8. And he, and he said a quick quote, and then he went on to a different point, but he said this. He said, intimacy, I didn't forget it already, how about that? Intimacy creates capacity, which leads to opportunity. Intimacy creates capacity, which leads to opportunity. In this passage is, is a, um, what many scholars will say is probably the final discourse of Jesus as he's kind of gearing up, getting ready for the... Uh, Gethsemane, and he's spending time with his disciples and just really sharing some great in-depth things, talking about what's going to happen, how to be more prepared for that. And, and he, he illustrates this uh, allegory, this story, if you will, of the vine. And Jesus calls himself the true vine, and we are the branches in this. And, and the vine dresser in there we saw back in verse, uh, verse 2, excuse me, verse 1, is God, and he is the vine dresser. He's the one responsible for the pruning and the, the taking off the branches and the the planting, the harvest, all those things, the fertilizing, that's the vine dresser's responsibility. And then the fruit are the things that we as Christians, it's what we're about, what we should be doing, what we should be producing, our works and our, our discipleship, the results of our discipleship and the people around us. And so uh, as we think about this, we have to understand too is that the, the image that we have of the vine throughout Scripture, especially in the Old Testament, uh, in Psalms chapter 80, it, it describes the vine as Israel being the vine. And then in Isaiah 5, we kind of see where that didn't really work out, that Israel wasn't the vine. They were instead of producing grapes, the Bible says they were producing wild grapes. And so, but Jesus says, I now am the true vine. What we see is this picture of, of how our connection should be with Christ. As Christians, we should be connected with Christ, right? If we're going to be like him, we need to be connected to him. And so in this, uh, this, this story, if you will, this analogy, if you will, Jesus demonstrates in a mighty and powerful way who we're supposed to be and what our relationship is supposed to be like. So from that quote, just a few things that I would like to talk to you about this morning uh, real quick is, is this, is that uh, first is this is intimacy, this word intimacy. Several different things in this passage we saw the word abide. Maybe your copy of Scripture said remain. To be to, this part of intimacy for us as a Christian needs to be our relationship with Christ and how we abide with Christ, how we remain with Christ. Think about the story that he's talking about here as a uh, branch. Is if it's supposed to remain into the true vine, if it doesn't, what happens first, it starts to wither a little bit, right? And it's not going to be producing any fruit. And at some point, pretty much, that vine is going to have to be, that branch is going to have to be cut off and done away with. 
And so that's what we don't want to happen. That's what we don't want to be. But what we want to do, and what Jesus instructs many different times is this, is that especially what's this going to happen is the disciples may not understand what's this going to happen is Jesus is going to be uh, on the cross and everything that's going to happen of those days. They really need to trust him. They really need to, to focus on him and his teachings and his commandments. And so to abide in him. So how do we do that? How do we remain in him? How do we stay connected? First is by his word. Verse 7 says this, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you. It's by the word of God. Um, we should be reading scripture. We should be studying scripture. We should be uh, memorizing scripture. We should be quoting scripture. We should be applying scripture. The second thing is by prayer. Continuing in that verse 7, it says, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. You know, when you read that, you think, okay, so I can, I can go to the gas station, get me one of those scratch-off tickets, ask, Lord, let this be that 20000 when I need a new pool. That's not exactly, I don't believe that's what he's trying to say here. Here's the deal, is that if we're abiding in Christ, if we're digging into God's Word, then our prayer life is going to be the things that will be Christ-like as well. The things that we pray about, the things that our heart desires the most, are the things that are going to please God. And I'm pretty sure God's going to love to bless us with those things. Amen? So when we pray, we got to understand that our prayer is not to change the circumstances all the time. Most of the time, it's to change us. It is to change our heart. And so as we abide in Christ, as we think about that, to remain in Him, it's a prayer life to be focused around Him. And also by His love, verse 9 and 10 says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Everything about us, should be done out of love. Shouldn't be done out of habit. Shouldn't be done out of hate. Shouldn't be done out of retribution. Everything about us should be done out of love. And how else can we remain in hell? We can be done by production. Verse 8 says this, By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Discipleship is a process that while we become like Christ, so are others around us doing that as well. If discipleship is done right, uh, will not just see us to come closer to Christ, but those around us. Earlier this year, our church uh, adopted a new discipleship strategy, and you've seen it all over. Uh, matter of fact, if you looked at your bulletin, you've seen it already today. Um, to get a better detail of that, you can go at the end of the long hallway and those three poster boards down there and help understand that. That's to um, educate people about who God is and who Jesus is in the gospel so that they come and trust and know Jesus as Lord and Savior of their life, and then to equip them with God's work through teaching, through preaching, through ministry opportunities, everything to help us to grow in our faith and become more like Christ, and then to empower us to take that outside these walls to a lost and dying world. And that is what discipleship is, and that is our goal as a church, is to help and understand and know of the lost world around us, to bring them into the fold of God as well. And so we, we remain by discipleship. We remain by production. We also remain, we also abide in Christ by plurality. Verse 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. I mean, you think about a vine, you think if it's just one branch, it, it may not last. If there's some fruit on it, sooner or later, it's the weight's going to give away, uh, protect from wildlife, protect from weeds, all that stuff. We are better together. By obedience, verse 10 reminds us this, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. When we keep His commandments, we abide in His love, in His unconditional love. How neat is that to think about? Now, we don't do good works to be loved by God, but because God loves us, we want to do good works, and we want to remain in His love. And then, finally, how do we remain in Him? How do we abide in Him? That is by being pruned. Verse 2 and 3, this is, this is one we don't think about as Christians. We think this is for the lost, but yet being pruned is something important for us as well. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. The vine dresser, being God, his responsibility is to, to deal with those things that aren't making that fruit. Whatever, how he deals with that, that's his responsibility. But in verse 3 it says, even all you, you are already being clean because of the words I've spoken to you. That word clean there is it's derivative and it comes from the idea of being pruned. Because of Jesus' words, that is helping. That is a process of pruning. And oftentimes these things that I just said, all these ways we can remain are ways that we can be pruned. Even the, 
even the branches that produce fruit, even the branches that produce the most fruit still have to be pruned. And for us today, even though we know we walk through difficult situations, even though we serve God the best that we can, we study God's word and we pray and we do our best to remain in his relationship, we wonder why we go through these seasons of pruning. Just know that that's God's plan all along for us. We trust that, we believe that, we walk with him through those situations. So my question for us today, thinking about abiding, thinking about remaining in him, how are you connected? Do you feel connected to the true vine this morning? Do you feel like th- that relationship is where it's supposed to be? Maybe a better question is how can we better connect? How can we better connect to God? How can we better connect to Christ? How we can better connect in such a way that we never be unconnected to the vine? What we need to do needs to be done not out of habit, not out of hate, but everything we do needs to be done out of love. And by Bible study, by prayer, by life groups, by worship, by personal devotion, by listening to Christian music, by reading Christian articles, books, by studying God's word, memorizing God's word, all these things that we need to have in our place so that we can be intimate with our Lord and Savior, that we can remain in a relationship that he sees fitting, that we remain in him as a true vine. Because when we do that, if our, if our life is, is geared in such a way that we're pleasing and honoring Christ, then the, the ultimately it will create capacity. It will create ministry. Ministry is going to be the overflow of what's going on as well. So the second thing I want you to see is, is the word capacity. Hebrews 12, 2 describes Jesus as the author and the finisher of our faith. In other words, the way Jesus lived his life, the ministry that he lived on this earth, is good enough to follow. It's good enough to see. It's good enough to go by. And we think about who Jesus was and what Jesus did, and we understand the ministry that he, he set forth. Uh, some ways that Jesus mentored, the way that, way that people come to Christ, come to him. First is he met the needs of those closest to him through discipleship. And then he also made a way for those who wanted to know him, wanted to get close to him through means of outreach, through means of ministry. You think of the miracles, and you think of through the Gospels, the things that Jesus did so that people come to know him as Savior and Lord. We think of those as outreach. Those are opportunities that Jesus did. And so he illustrates for us this idea of ministry himself. To be like him means we got to minister to others. And if we are abiding in him, then the end result is going to be we will be ministering to others. Without ministry, we can't bear much fruit, if any fruit. You see, it's just that ministry. When we start to bear the fruit, that's when those seeds start to grow. Um, so my question for you is what has your ministry been this year? What, what, or what has God done in your life? What has God done taught you? What has God done uh, to lead you to where he is? And guess what? That whole thing we were going to talk about? There it is. This year, we began in the year just to, this has been a great year, and I just want you to understand what the church has done. We finished up hosting disaster relief teams that were going here and back forth from Arkansas and Oklahoma to Florida. We hosted a Sentinel training where we had statewide people from all over the state to come, but the majority was from our church who could get geared up and get ready to serve God overseas. We brought in a new minister of music, and with that, we've seen growth and quality and numbers in our music ministry. We had a widow and widower's banquet that was just one of the most greatest things. And then so many more people besides the deacons were involved. It took so many people to pull that off. We hosted ACT prep sessions for students who come to our campus so they can sit here and study and get prepared for the test that would help them in better life. We hosted several parent night outs thanks to so many volunteers. For the crisis pregnancy, for the Center for Pregnancy Choices, we do a baby bottle drive every year. We've always held on to that. Uh, for the past several years, we've held on to the record. This year, we shattered that record by donating $4,646.76. We had a large team for their life walk, and the fundraising that come from that as well added to that. We had youth breakfast fundraisers where the youth and the parents and people involved in that come and raise money for church missions, for the youth group missions as well. We had other mission trip fundraisers to go for those three different uh, international mission trips. Our King and Mission train during spring break saw so much accomplished with many people going to the other side of the world to help build and to help grow and to help evangelize uh, a place where the gospel still needs to be shared. Uh, we saw terrific Tuesdays and thrilling Thursdays go on during spring break and as well through the summer months, thanks to so many volunteers who drove the vans and chaperoned 
for that. We have men and ladies Bible studies go throughout the week that often helps people who are uh, in service on Sunday still have an opportunity to come and fellowship and grow spiritually as well, as well as others who come to that. Uh, we saw educational leadership meetings and trainings take place and happen and, and equip and uh, to, to, to equip them better for their serving as well. Through Gideons, we supported giving hundreds and thousands of dollars to our Gideon ministry, our local camp, and, and, and trusting it to go all throughout the world. Um, we had spring and fall family nights where so many volunteers came and provided and cooked and did. And we had so many guests to come and get to know our church through the children's ministry through that avenue as well. Through our Easter services, we had a Monday, Thursday, and a Good Friday service. And it was a little different this year. And so many people were involved with that. After that, we went out and gave out hundreds of Bibles at Ramey's parking lot and a Walmart parking lot. We hosted banquets for band programs and football programs. We had a baccalaureate service where we loved on teenagers and their families and, 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 and just... Uh, congratulated them for their accomplishment as well. We had kids spring and Christmas musicals. It would not have happened with so many hours, with so many people to take place in that to help our children learn about Christ through unique ways, through music. We had people to join and train for disaster relief, feeding, and chainsaw teams. We had record-setting VBS attendance through dates throughout the, this last week with thousands of volunteer hours, over $1,500 given to the George family in Papua New Guinea. We saw seeds planted and we saw salvations as well. Our youth loaded up and adults loaded up and spent a week of their summer serving others in Mission Fuge. We had a, a great turnout for Fourth of July blasts and fireworks. We had so many people from our community to get to, to welcome and to know us and feel God's love through that outreach. Our children's Bible drills happened on Thursday nights thanks to some awesome volunteers. And then also on Thursday nights, we had people to come up here and open the gym. And so our youth can come and play, and they've given up their time for that as well. We had carloads of school supplies donated to go to all the schools in this area. We had a softball team who, did, who represented our church and, and local ministries as that and, and outreach through that. We had Dominican public mission trip where we saw Bible studies. We saw meals carried to homes. We saw children's activities. So many things went on to everybody went to the Dominican Republic this year. We also had prayer walks in all four of the local schools and beyond where people went and walked and prayed over our schools and prayed God would move in our schools. We hosted and fed Florence football teams and the gospel was presented to every and each and every person that was there. We hosted the Richmond football teams, band, cheerleader, dance, and the gospel was presented to every person that was there. We had well-attended ladies' night outs on campus and off campus where uh, fellowship happened. We had a church work day. It was phenomenal. We got so much stuff done because of your time coming and, and sharing and, and serving as well. We ordained young deacons this year. We had a Haiti trip where we roofed two churches, didn't think we'd probably get one done, but two were done, and God just moved in that situation and allowed that trip to happen. We hosted the Top 20 Operation Christmas Child Donor Banquet where we were able to uh, just allow time for other churches, to, leaders to come in and, and be served as well. We packed over 300 Operation Christmas Child shoebox at an average of $35 a piece. That's over $10,000 just in that ministry that we invested. Our fall festival saw hundreds and hundreds of people come through our doors. We loved on each and every one of them. Over 23 families received generous amounts of food and food vouchers for Thanksgiving. We had students and adults give up their Thanksgiving holidays to go to Dallas and to go to those processing centers for Operation Christmas Child and process those boxes and get them ready to go overseas. We had life group fellowships where people love and equip one another outside of Sunday mornings as well. We had a choir and orchestra Christmas presentation that was absolutely phenomenal and brought us to the throne of God. We saw children's ministry uh, lead us again in, a, in doing a Christmas flow that even though it won second, First place for the second year in a row, it still led others to the throne of God. They're presenting a true message of what Christmas is about. We had over 60 kids receive gifts, not just once, but these as well this year. We saw over 20 families receive generous food vouchers as well. Our library ministry began luncheons to help equip our people and to, to dive into uh, reading and, and studying and, and more. But not only that, but they started and, and uh, expounded on the Library to You ministry where not only we're just doing things and not just the open door library you go in, but that library is going out to our shut-ins, to nursing homes, and week after week we are ministering to those uh, who need it. We see a benevolent ministry where just tons and tons of families have been helped. Over $12,000 has been given through our benevolent ministry. But they don't just give out money. They counsel with the people. They pray with the people of their needs. They, they share the gospel with them. They give copies of God's word with them. Through bereavement, we help numerous 
families who struggled and grieving times of death in their family. We reached out to them, we brought them meals, we provided meals for them. Our Building and Grounds Committee has saved us tens and tens of thousands of dollars of work this year just by the labor that they've done at this church, but also serving you guys as well by going out and above into your homes and helping you. Our deacons ministry uh, has done an excellent job of helping our widows and increase their prayer life, and they're supporting the ministries of the church. Our band ministry runs every service and they bring in children who may not ever have another way to get here to hear about the gospel of Jesus. And everywhere those fans goes, it is a light into that community. Our preschool and children volunteers volunteer every week, even giving up time to be in here to serve so that others can come to know Jesus. Our life group ministries have in reach and outreach. It's been excellent this year. Countless meals were given, not to mention the discipleship that happens week in and week out. We have the most active WMU ministry that I know of a church inside and greater, and you can't change my mind about that, who do so much to serve and so much to do from, from the shoebox, excuse me, from the bags to the jump ropes to uh, gifts to the nursing homes, the money that they do on their own, and just do so much, not to mention uh, promoting the mission offerings that we do here. Our nursing home ministries, we have three different nursing homes who are being ministered by over five different ministries within our church each week. Magic Club has done fellowships and trips and encouragement from there is just, just amazing. Our youth ministry, we've had many to step up to the plate this year in our youth ministry in the absence of a youth minister and, and to see the ministry keep going where we've seen creativity, growth, and discipleship like never before. Our Sunday and Wednesday volunteers, people that put up the crossing signs to unlocking the doors, making the coffee. I don't have a clue who does all that, but it gets done, thankfully. <laughs> From projection video, security greeters, everything that goes on. Giving to date, up until a few days ago, you gave $770,352.17 against a budget of only $747,195. On top of that, you gave $56,015.50 to pay off the building where we only needed about $50,000 to make the note. On top of that, you gave $9,084 to a state missions. On top of that, you gave $7,945 to North American Missions. The International Missions received $8,672, and then World Missions Line gained over $6,000 this year. We saw over 20 members join, and we saw multiple professions of faith. Church, we are an active church. Ministry happens in our church, and if you sit in and think, well, is there something I can do? I'm telling you, it's not that the church isn't doing anything, because we are. And so my challenge to you is to think about the ministry that you going on in your life, the ministry that is happening with you, what needs to change? Is there something that needs to change? I, I realize that some of you say, well, Jeremy, I'm involved in about 80% of that, and thank you so much. And some of you say, well, I'm probably involved in 8% or less. And my challenge to you is pray what the Lord needs to do. First thing you need to do is go back to first step. What does it mean to abide? We do a lot as a church, but it's clear that God may be leading you to do even more. While some of this stuff may be done out of habit, I'm pretty well that a lot of this is done out of love. And the work that we do is evident that our church loves Jesus. It's evident that our church is in the Word. It's evident that our church is praying. It's evident that our church is being pruned because of the ministry that is happening. Let that be an encouragement. It's not just something else that we do. It is ministry. Because it's through those ministries, just as Jesus did, that leads to outreach. So that when they come closer, then we can lead to discipleship. And when that happens, then they can go out and lead, bringing others into the fold. The last thing I want to talk to you about is opportunity. Intimacy creates capacity that leads to opportunity. Opportunity is simply proving our discipleship. That's what I've been leading to this whole time. If, if we really are in Christ and we're growing in our faith and we're serving the church, then something's going to have to give. We're, the people around us are going to come to know who Jesus is, right? The people around us are going to come to faith in Jesus Christ at some point. Um, there's a story... I may have shared this with y'all before. I don't know. Um, there was an oil refinery, and the, and the company that owns it, the CEO was carrying uh, a lot of people around, a lot of investors around to look at this new oil refinery that was being built. And it was pretty neat, state-of-the-art facility. A lot of technical gizwords. They went around and saw the vats. They saw the gauges. They saw the computers. They saw people working there. and just They were very impressed by everything that happened to take this oil to something that's useful and to use it to do. And as they were about done with it, one of the investors stopped the, the guy leading the, uh, the trip, the journey through the place, if you will, 
and said, I, I see all this stuff going on. It's pretty neat. But my question is, I haven't seen where the outflow is. Where's your finished product at? Where does it go? And he said, well, that's, we have to take it and use it to run the place. And so some, oftentimes that's kind of what churches do. We do just enough ministry to keep us going. That's not Briar Hill Baptist Church, and I'm grateful and thankful to say that. But we do a ministry that's not about keeping our doors open. It's not about just us and us being edified and lifted up. While that should be happening, but our ministry should be reaching out to others so that others come to know Jesus. The end work of ministry is more disciples. I always said this uh, doing youth ministry. Said, the fruit of a Christian should at some point be another Christian. As we mentioned, we think about the vine and the fruit that we're producing, the the ministry that happens, there's seeds in that. And as enough ministry happens, there's a lot of seeds that are going to be planted. And when those seeds are planted, it produces more disciples. Our church's discipleship strategy, what we're just talking about, is geared as an individual. It's what we need to do. We need to worry about ourselves first. We need to uh, educate ourselves first. We need to equip ourselves first. We need to empower ourselves. And ultimately, when that happens, then those around us, we lead them, we we want to educate them. We want to equip them. We want to empower them. That goes straight to our church's purpose statement. Some of you may not even know that we have a purpose statement. It comes straight from Colossians 128. It says, Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Church, we did all that we did last year for the sole purpose that more people come to know Jesus Christ. It wasn't to pat ourselves on the back, even though it's not wrong to do that sometimes. It wasn't to make us look better from other churches. It wasn't to make us to, to compare ourselves to anything. But everything about us is so that others know Jesus. And not just know Jesus, but come and be mature believers. And so my challenge to you is this this morning. As we think about that, what have we done? Who, what have we done? What opportunities have you had this year? Um, is this, what opportunities have you had to share your discipleship? What have, opportunities have you had to prove your discipleship? Are you cultivating relationships with the lost? Are you cultivating relationships with those you work with who, in your home or in your school? What do you need to do? Are those people around you getting closer or further away from the Lord? Because ultimately that's our responsibility. God puts us in those paths. We don't have to wait until we get signed up to go on an overseas mission trip to serve. God puts us in places right now where he wants us to serve. He cares just as much about the lost people in America as he does anywhere else. And so we need to think about that as we're already in the mission field each and every day. I started out talking about a year in review. We started talking about things that we need to look back and reflect on and who we are and what we should do. Um, 2 Corinthians 13.5, Paul reminds the church to examine yourselves, test yourselves. Basically, see, is Jesus your Lord? Because he should be. And if he is, then your life should be demonstrated on that. Does a quick checkup uh, on ourselves convince us of this evidence? Briar Hill Baptist Church is a very active church for our size. We always seem to rise to the occasion. We've been talking about that with our missions committee the past year. And the things that put before us, we do, we do it out of love, and that is evident. We are a church who loves God, and that is amazing. But are, are we just remaining uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the first stage? Some of you say, that this ain't happened. None of this ministry has really not happened in my life. Mind you, the first thing we need to do is to abide and is to remain in Christ. But at some point, we've got to do more than just that. We've got to serve. We want to love on one another. We want to do things. We want to be engaged in the ministries that are happening in our church and other areas. And when that happens, if you're that, maybe you've been serving and doing at some point, you just have the fruit I'm producing is not enough. I'm, preparing, I'm producing some fruit, but I want to be producing much fruit. And that's when we need to seize those opportunities. Maybe we need to be more equipped. Maybe we, we need to do more things. And I'm, I guarantee you in 2020, our church is going to have opportunities one after the other to do that. And you'll hear a lot of things in the coming weeks of how we can uh, better be equipped to serve. But if you're not, let me encourage you that I realize that in this church, in this size, in this room, that the Lord may be convicting you about what you haven't done or what you aren't doing. And that is my encouragement to you. We're finishing out this year. We can't do this year over again, but we can look toward 2020. We can look toward the days ahead. We can look toward tomorrow. We can look toward this afternoon and say, what can I do differently? And that is the challenge for us. If we simply want to abide in Jesus, we're going to produce much fruit. And that's what we should do.
So what is it that needs to change for you this morning? What is it that you need to do different this morning? Maybe, maybe God's just saying that you need to remain and abide for a while. You just need to spend some time with him. But I, ultimately, I know that God wants us to produce much fruit in here this morning. And maybe you say, well, I, b- before I, any of that happens, I need to encourage you to know this, is that without salvation, we can't abide whatsoever. And if you're here and you're lost and don't know Jesus as Savior and Lord, I would love to talk to you. Brother Mal would love to talk to you this morning about what it means to abide, what it means to be saved, to trust the gospel of Jesus Christ and put our faith and trust in him. And that's what we need to take care of today. But God may be calling you to more. It may be uh, to, do, to go out of your comfort zone this year. And maybe you just need to come and pray about that. Maybe you don't know what it is. Maybe you say, there's a lot of things happening, Jeremy. But there's nothing I really feel comfortable doing this church. Well, maybe God wants to uh, call you to lead something new at this church. And maybe you need to be praying about that this morning. Maybe God wants to uh, use your talents and gifts and you say that, you know what, to, to serve God, to evangelize, to reach out, to, to prove our discipleship. I don't have the money to go overseas. I don't have the, the ability to say to do this. All we got to do is share what God has done in our heart. And that's, the, that's the, how we plant those seeds is through our testimony and through evangelizing and through sharing. We don't have to have the Bible memorized front and back. We don't have to be a great wordsmith. I'm not. But I can still share my testimony with those who are lost and hopefully lead them to Christ. But if we're reading God's Word and we're praying and we're engaged in worship, you'd be surprised what you can do when it comes to sharing about your Lord and Savior. So let that be encouragement for us today. What needs to be different for the year 2020? Pray with me. Father, I thank you so much for this time, for this hour, for this opportunity to be in your house. And, and God, I know I, I, just the words have been said. I pray that, Father, it's just been edifying to you. And I pray that we understand and know what it means this morning to, to abide in your Son, who is the true vine, Father. God, I pray as we uh, respond to you this morning, I pray if there's those who just need to abide in you, who know that they're saved, but never really grown in their relationship, that can't produce fruit whatsoever because they don't spend time in your word they don't spend time in prayer enough time here in your house and worship and and bible study and discipleship opportunities that you would just convict us of that this morning and god you call us to do more you call us to ministry and oftentimes we just pass on that because it's not our comfort zone it's not what we want to do but god i pray that you would convict us of that this morning that we surrender to you and whatever it may be to serve in this church to serve in our community whatever it means to be to cultivate those relationships, Father, so that when the opportunity comes, we share who you are. We share our testimony. We share what you've done in our lives. And hopefully others come to know Jesus as Savior and Lord. Lord, I pray if there's one in here that uh, says that, uh, they need to do more, maybe it's joining this church, maybe it's salvation, or surrender to missions or ministry, or whatever it is, Father, I pray that we be obedient to you this morning, Father. We thank you for this time. We ask all these things in your sign, precious and holy name. Amen. Stand with us, please.
Thank you, Jeremy. Great word from God. We appreciate you so much. And we appreciate all of our friends who are here today. God bless you. Hope you have a great day today. Glad to have guests with us, and we hope that you'll come again. And uh, Miss Marlin, three quarters of a century. I just had to say that. Uh, flowers look beautiful. I was looking at those. I thought, artificial? No, those are live. Those are so beautiful in honor of her 75th. That's published in the bulletin. I don't know if I'd be that brave, Miss Marlon. But it's that. She had a birthday on Christmas Day. So she always celebrates. So, uh, we want to. Thank everybody who ministered to the Webb family Friday as well. Thank you all. Um, praying for them. If that's all you were able to do, that's a good thing. But they were here for service Friday. The lost Miss Bonnie. Continue to lift that family up. And thank you all for all the expressions of love in uh, our family loss as well. We buried my, uh, my mother's youngest sister, my aunt, yesterday. And we appreciate all the communications that we had from you. We even had a deacon show up. Thank you. We appreciate that so much. And uh, y'all got a great chairman and deacons. And he's doing a good job. Thank you. Uh, we're going to pray. And uh, Jeremy, you going to meet him in the back? And... <laughs> hint, hint. <laughs> I think you'll want to pat him on the back and say thank you for that. And if you didn't hear that litany, of things that this church does and what we did just this past year I can validate everything that he mentioned makes it feel like y'all got to be exhausted with all of the work you've done let's make 2020 twice as good amen we're gonna pray be dismissed you uh, pray for uh, services tonight we got the Lord's Supper here tonight we want to encourage you to come we'll be leading in that service any word before we close Amen. 50 years. Bless her heart. <laughs> Congratulations. Well, let's pray, and uh, we'll see you next time that we get together. And God give you a great day today and, and bless you richly. Andy Gressett. Where is Andy? Is he back there? Did he slip out? He left. Huh? You know, don't go on cruises with him and the family. They were on those two cruise ships that ran into each other the other day. I, Andy was upstairs telling the captain what to do. And <laughs> <laughs> we're glad y'all are safe and back with us. And uh, The Matrick family right here, and all of them who went. Uh, would you lead us in a closing prayer?